know, to include or exclude, that is the question. So let me start off uh, with a case. This was a crime that happened two years ago. Uh, there was a slumber party with uh, eight girls aged uh, nine or ten years old, and they alleged uh, after the weekend Three of them claimed uh, to their parents that they had been molested by the father of the girl whose house it was. This is a picture of the basement. And uh, he said he wasn't involved at all. And some of the pictures that I'll show are related to uh, some of the evidence in this case from an article of clothing. This is DNA mixture data. And you've heard about it before. There are tall peaks. You see a 7 and a 14. And then there are shorter peaks, like a 10 and a 12, if you look at the 10 peak, the x-axis or horizontal, uh, horizontally corresponds to which of the different alleles it is, and the height corresponds to how much DNA is present. So you can imagine if you had a mixture of two people, maybe there's a lot of the 7 and the 14 from one person and less of the 10 and the 12 from a second person. So that's something you might think of saying. And then there are methods that people can apply to interpret. Now, all DNA methods are roughly the same in that uh, you, you gather the data, and then you infer or should be inferring genotypes from the data and then making a comparison. The thresholds that we heard about are simplifications of the data that are good for people. Uh, instead of trying to create hundreds or thousands of variables that model the data and all the uncertainty, the lab does some experiments. They draw a line. Anything over the line is considered in like here, the 7 and the 14, and they're given equal weight. Anything under the line is cast out and considered to not be part of that. And as you've heard, that's a problem that you might give zero probability to events that don't appear uh, in the data. And that can be a problem, for example, if you know that the 714 corresponds to an individual in the data and you're looking for something else. There are methods to deal with allele dropout, where since you drew the threshold and you threw out some of your data, now you want the data back. So you kind of conjure these phantom peaks and you imagine they might be there, and you bring them back in with some probability. And that does work better than just throwing them out completely in the first place. You bring things back, and now the probabilities are greater than zero. OK, so there are issues with manual interpretation, both for evidence uh, in a particular case, as well as for databases when you're trying to do, uh, cold, do searches on cold cases. With evidence, the problems are this. You can call very good data inconclusive. There may be peaks that are too low for human methods to look at visually with thresholds. There may be too many contributors to handle uh, beyond two or three people. Uh, human analysts may be uncomfortable with the methods they have. And there's potential examination bias where if you're making direct comparison between the data and a suspect or some individual, Eddie Eldror gets mentioned in every talk. So again, uh, he's done studies on this of how there is potential bias when people make these comparisons. For databases, the current CODIS system makes its hits by association, by comparing alleles, not genotypes, and not by actual mathematical match. The result is the comparisons are just done by inclusion, and that's quite weak, and many false hits could be made. In order to avoid those false hits and be safer, the result is they restrict the upload of DNA mixture evidence, which is most of the evidence in many labs now. So only 10 or 20 percent of the evidence that's being collected by crime labs ever makes it into a DNA database. The method I'm talking about now, it's in general, it's genotype modeling. Other groups have done it. We've been doing it for 15 years. And true allele's a version of that. The concept is to have a model where you say, how do you explain the data through all, by considering the genotypes that could construct it? So each point here is a response to the preceding slide. From an evidence perspective, the goal is to preserve data information. That's the whole point of these systems. It's to work as hard as it can, even if it takes days, to retain all the information in that five-person mixture, say. It uses all the peaks, high or low, essentially has no thresholds. It works from data. It doesn't make any arbitrary decisions. It can use any number of contributors. I think we don't go much beyond six in practice, but the methods are the same. And our validation studies show that the behavior of the system is the same. The met method is completely objective 
in terms of never seeing a suspect or comparison reference in a way that I'll make clear in an example. It can't be biased because it doesn't know what you're looking for and it doesn't care. On the database side, there's a corresponding database and hits are based on likelihood ratio match statistics. It's all done on math. It's very sensitive. We've done studies where we show that we find true hits and it's specific and that it only finds the true hits. So this is sort of how the system works. It has many variables. Here are two of the main ones. First, mixture weight. These two numbers, 25% and 75% add up to 100. So suppose there are two contributors. The system separates the components uh, into, in this case, two. It could be three, four, or five different components with random variation. Everything in true alleles is a random variable. The data are fixed, and everything it's trying to determine is is uncertain. It's a Bayesian system, and so it tries to establish that. And so it separates the c contributors and can use that information. This is probably the key slide if you want to understand how the computer thinks. It's when juries lean forward and want to understand what's happening. Two key concepts in genotype inference. A genotype, by the way, is that allele pair of a contributor that John and Adele were talking about earlier. First, it's very thorough. By computer simulation, it considers hundreds of thousands of possible solutions. It works ab initio. It just tries out everything that it possibly can. Um, and it, where the data is, where the data isn't. It's objective in that it does not know what you're looking for. It just works from the data. Its goal is to explain the peak pattern. Underneath, you can see those peaks, 7, 10, 12, and 14. And these rectangles, the large blue pair, is a lot of one major contributor. And the genotype shown as 10, 12 is a minor contributor from a second individual. And this is a good, this is a pattern that explains the data. But what the computer does is it tries out hundreds of thousands of possibilities, and it moves those rectangle pairs and other variables all over the place to where the data isn't, which has essentially zero probability, to where the data is, which has more probability, and then sometimes to where the data really is and explains that pattern, and that's where it gets most of the probability. So it's not, it's generating these patterns almost independently of the data. It's just trying to understand what's there. Now, when it's all done, what it's done is if you can imagine that one locus of the 15 loci that scientists might use for, in this case, for the two contributors, for one contributor at one locus, there are maybe 100 possible allele pairs, all with low probability. What the data does is it concentrates that probability into just a few possibilities. Depends on the data. It could be one possibility. It could be 15 possibilities. Depends on the data. Once that data, once that probability has been concentrated, which you're seeing in blue, still hasn't seen a suspect. What you are seeing in brown on the bottom is the random population. That's the chance of a person taken from the population of having that particular genotype. A simple way of understanding what a likelihood ratio is, or genotype match, is to answer how much more does the suspect match the evidence than a random person. So now, for the first time, you say, oh, the suspect happens to be a 10-12. You look at the 10-12, you could, could have been anywhere, and you look at the ratio of the evidence genotype in blue to the random population genotype in brown. In this case, that number is bigger than one. It didn't have to be. The computer didn't know what you were going to ask. That ratio, say, is 30. That's what it happens to be in this case. So imagine if you have 15 loci, each of them have a um, likelihood ratio, say, hypothetically, they're all around a value of 10. Then if you multiply 10 times 10, 15 times, and you get a quadrillion, that's a 1 followed by 15 zeros. As Adele said, when scientists measure information, they use the logarithm or the exponent. We count the number of zeros. So instead of saying quadrillion, we say 15. Instead of saying a million, we say 6, a 1 followed by 6 zeros. That way we can keep track of these smaller numbers and explain them to people. So what is an inclusion? That was, that's one of the questions here. An inclusion is nothing more than a positive amount of information. It's an exponent that's greater than zero. So if it's a six, that indicates support for an inclusion. That's a million. If it's 12, it's like a trillion. And we've done validation studies where true allele finds the, uh, finds the correct answer. And this is taken from 100 casework samples. On average, it gets an 11 
as in Spinal Tap, right? Just a little bit more. It's 100 billion as is the average. On the same data, you see how thresholds lose information. Uh, the CPI method shown in green contracts the same data, doesn't, it calls 25% of it inconclusive and ends up with an average match statistic of a million or six zeros. And when you raise thresholds, as labs are doing with stochastic thresholds, half of the evidence is discarded, never used or reported on with, in this study with an average match statistic of 100, which is less than 100 billion. What is an exclusion? An exclusion is when you get a, a negative weight of evidence. You get 0. 0.00001, it goes in the other direction. So minus six means one over a million. Minus 12 is one over a trillion. In this case, in a study comparing against many random individuals, the average was coincidentally negative 20, go figure it out. And again, the rate of going past zero in uh, millions of comparisons was one in 20,000 with very small numbers, like one or two. So if you get a number like six, it's real. Trulial is used in the case that I described. The child molester got uh, a mass statistic of 20 quadrillion and he got 20 years. We've done published so far four peer-reviewed scientific validation papers. It's, Trulial's been admitted in Pennsylvania, California, and Northern Ireland after defense challenges. So the work we do, I should say, is both for defense and prosecution. There's an appellate ruling with the Supreme Court confirmation in the state for precedent in Pennsylvania. Trulial has approval from the New York State Commission on Forensic Science for use in the state lab in Albany. We've written over 100 reports in criminal cases, and there have been over 15 trials. I'm not the only one who's testified. Government analysts have, analysts have as well in crimes of rape, murder, terror, weapons, and so on. True alleles being deployed around the U.S. and around the world. Blue shows states that are bringing on board their own casework systems in-house, and there are other states where we're also providing interpretation services for groups. Okay, so I'd like to close by talking about DNA truth, and since this is the criminal justice section, criminal justice. Uh, D-Day was yesterday, so it's a good day to quote Winston Churchill, who said, actually in 1916, this truth is incontrovertible, panic may resent it, ignorance may deride it, malice may distort it, but there it is. Okay, so genotype models are more accurate. We're not the only ones who create them. They preserve evidence. They preserve the information the taxpayers are paying for, and that's what they do. They may take a long time, but the, more ver the first version of Trulil took 30 seconds live at a conference on a laptop. Now that same problem with a hundred times the number of variables might take half a day, but it's a, it's a very robust answer. So if you have a more accurate answer, who cares? Or someone said earlier, why does this matter? Well, this is who it might matter to. It might matter to police who want to have very effective evidence databases to catch criminals through DNA databases. If you're keeping 100% of your mixture evidence on a database, instead of 10%, maybe you have a better chance of catching a criminal. Prosecutors care, the ones I work with are very passionate about truth, and they want, do want to find the right person, and they want to be able to convict someone who the evidence shows is guilty. I work with defenders who believe they have innocent people, and they would like to exonerate them. Courts care about truth, which is why when we testify, we say we're going to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. But if you know that reporting a match statistic of, of 100 and the real number is 100 billion, is that really the whole truth? And I think the citizens who pay billions of dollars a year for forensics labs and DNA really want a return on their investment. They'd like to know that everything that can be done to prevent rape and other crimes is being done, not just what's convenient for protocols and labs, but everything that science has to offer. So, that's why we do what we do. That's what Trulial is about. There's information on that web link. And we have hundreds of hours to put you asleep to on our website. Of movies, articles, not just eight. It goes on and on and on. Uh, articles, presentations, uh, TV segments, and so on at sidegen.com. And thank you for your attention.